It's rare that a high-level chess game is a perfect story. The game is not a sonnet. There's little structure, no editing, and two authors who want to tear each other apart. The work of art created by chess players is a result of two clashing forces molding moment to moment to the whim and brilliance of the other. The opposing strengths don't allow for immediate explosion. Any slip will be deadly. One can imagine a master of Aikido and of Karate, both brimming with force and precision, power of completely different natures, and now these beings come into conflict. They look at one another. No rush. Much will be decided by what doesn't happen. In high-level competition, grandmasters and international masters from different worlds are brought together. Their chess education, religious background, morality, and day-to-day -day life are often hilariously opposing. Suddenly a group of 10 or 20 of these mind gladiators are thrown into a melting pot for two weeks. This can lead to fascinating, if not bizarre, dinner conversation, to intense friendships and rivalries. Some players are bitter, others at peace. Some talk, others listen. The human beings meet while the competitors notice how quickly another eats his soup. Such was the scene in my last tournament in Bermuda. Every year the Mermaid Beach Hotel hosts a prestigious closed tournament in which GMs and IMs from all over the world show up to soak in the rays and duke it out. In 98, Nigel Freeman, the tournament organizer, decided to invite 10 GMs and IMs from Europe to compete in a team competition with 10 of us from the Americas. Most of the players invited to Bermuda are young, up-and-coming, charismatic talents who go to war on the basketball court and dig the beach between rounds. This is without question my favorite tournament of the year. In the second round, I was paired against a German grandmaster named Michael Bezeld. We played once before, in Bermuda 97, and I was able to develop a mating attack out of a difficult positional struggle. I've watched him play in a few tournaments and have noticed some interesting tendencies. Bezeld has a peculiar style with specific weaknesses. First of all, he does not like to make central pawn moves early in the game. Too committal, static. He doesn't like to make decisions. In other words, he likes to maintain a funky detachment in the position, and he understands unorthodox positional maneuvering at a very high level. Most strengths tend to have a counterforce, and I have found that he is often unwilling to get specific when the position demands it, and he sometimes has difficulty handling the transitional moment in which the struggle transforms from the abstract into blood. Because of an attraction to what comes before engagement, I think his sense of danger is often impeded by denial in the instant bullets start to fly. Of course, Bezeld is a grandmaster, and so to take advantage of any such weakness is very difficult. I had the black pieces in this game, which gave me even less control of the situation. All I could do was play good moves, give him as many specific situations as possible, all the while dancing his strange dance of detachment. While I approached this game with a plan, I did not try to impose it upon the struggle, so much as let the position bring about critical moments in which I would make a stylistic decision. One distinction should be understood. When I say that my opponent does not like to make concrete decisions, I do not mean that I should make the game tactical, but that I should give him a situation in which the position dictates that the only way to maintain equilibrium would be for him to go in a direction which is against his grain. I would let him work against chess, a far greater opponent than myself. Before continuing with the game, I'd like you to give some thought to the stylistic analysis I just gave. You'll often enter a game with a sense for your opponent's strengths and weaknesses. Psychological preparation is a huge part of the chess struggle, but there is also a danger in being overly conscious of the other guy's thinking. We may forget to think ourselves. Throughout the lesson, I'll ask you to try to find my moves in the critical positions. In a sense, this will be a training game in the practice of being conscious of who your opponent is. I must warn you, however, that the most important part of playing somebody whose strengths and weaknesses you know is not to lose yourself. In other words, as Bobby Fischer said, play the board, not the man. And so, two conflicting impulses will run through this game. Much of my teaching will be to have patience, not to impose your will upon the position. No rush. Let it flow. Find your center. We must learn this to learn that. The game began C4, C6. My idea is to take the center with D5. Knight C3, D5. E3, Knight F6, Knight F3. E6, B3. And already, if you look at White's moves, you can, you can have the sense from my opponent's style of play. He's not making the most natural move, D4, but is holding back and continuing his development within this detachment. Remember earlier I said that he doesn't like to make central moves. It's kind of a strange description because the center is the most important part of the chess game, really. And, of course, all grandmasters have a very keen sense for that. But my opponent prefers to only make central moves in the opening win it is sort of the end of a, of a build, sort of like he makes he likes central move to be a climax as opposed to simply a structural decision. One of, he's one of the rare players that way. It's a very interesting style in which he plays. So if I were playing as a, 
most people here, I would, they would play d4 and it would transpose into a Moran structure. My game against Lotnikov, another annotated game, is in this position. Knight bd7, queen c2. Now, a tricky part of this position is that I have to be ready at any point for my opponent to play d4 and transpose into a Moran, so I have to be flexible in my development. If I were to play a move which would be incorrect in the Moran structure, for instance, g6, with the idea of developing my bishop on g7, then he could quickly transpose into that with myself being forced into developing incorrectly. So I played bishop e7, a move which is consistent with or without the white pawn on d4. Bishop b2, b6. And here my opponent played bishop e2. Now, the reason I played bishop e7, b6, is because I want to develop my bishop on b7, eventually play c6 to c5, and the bishop will be very good on this diagonal. So it looks like a strange move and it doesn't seem to really do anything, but eventually my bishop will come alive. The other reason, if the white pawn were on d4 instead of d2, this is called the anti moran system with the white queen on c2, I play a system of development with my bishop on e7, I play with b6 and bishop b7. So I've been developing my pieces so that if at any moment he transposes into the moran, I'd be prepared for that. This is a typical move order skirmish in the opening. My opponent knew that I played the system, and odds are if I had played differently, he would have transposed into a system which I would have been uncomfortable with. I played b6, and he played bishop e2. This is the first move which is a real concession on his part. Reason being, in the Moran, if my opponent's pawn is on d4, his bishop belongs on d3. A little subtlety, because it gives him a little more control of the e4 square, and pressures my h7 point if I'm the castle king side. So my opponent playing bishop e2 was the, was the first real evidence of the fact that he's not going to play d4. Bishop e2, I played bishop e7, and he castled. I castled as well. If his bishop were on d3, and his pawn on d4, and he were uncastled, I would hold back on castling and play a move like rook c8. But because he doesn't have pressure on the h7 pawn, he's allowed me to castle freely without worrying about my king side. Rook c1. It's strange the way chess players have to play the position, and yet they have very, very true styles of play. My opponent plays the move rook c1, and if I were playing against somebody who I didn't know, or if I were playing against another grandmaster, I'd say, oh, he plays rook c1, centralizing a rook. He'll probably play his other rook to d1. He'll play d4 soon, because it's definitely what the position calls for. But when playing against this guy, I've seen a lot of his games, and I knew without any question what he was going to do. His idea by playing rook c1 was to play queen c2 to b1, and then eventually to a1 which may seem like a completely obscure plan, making the queen into a bishop, but it is surprisingly effective in, a, in an, an odd way in these positions because it pressures the a1h8 diagonal. The queen is out of any of the potentially opening files. If you look at, for instance, the c file, if my rook was on c8, if the c file were to open up, my rook would be on his queen, so on b1 and then a1, it's out of the way. It's a very interesting maneuver that people, in, in a position like this, the tactics aren't so important. The bo board isn't exploding right away. And so what you can feel is that there's time for maneuvers which may be good, potentially, and there's not an immediate impact if it, if it doesn't do anything right away. So my, my opponent playing rook c1, he has this strange idea of playing queen b1 to a1, which will pressure the a1, h8 diagonal. I played rook c8, a normal move. And sure enough, he played queen b1. So now his idea is clear eventually. He's gotten off the, he's gotten off the c file, which is useful, and eventually he'll put the queen to a1. I played a move which... um. Makes sense. If you take a moment and you think about how it would be logical for me to develop my game here, what would you do? I put my bishop on b7. He is not taking immediate central control. He has no immediate threat. I played c6 to c5, taking a little space in the center and opening up my bishop. Now, if there any time the, my d5 pawn and his c4 pawn exchange, my bishop will be on a very good diagonal. c5 is a logical move that takes advantage of the fact that he has not yet played d4. In this kind of position, I already had the feeling that his best plan would be to play either immediately or to prepare d2 to d4. And this would lead to an equal game. Complex in the middle, there's a lot of central tension. But eventually, after the exchanges, the game would be about equal. Maybe he should play the move rook after d1 first and then d4. But I also knew that my opponent would never do this because this wasn't his style of play. He played c takes d5, knight takes d5, knight e4 a move that I also expected but was very happy to see. The point is that if the knights are exchanged, my bishop, first of all, will be completely free along the a8h1 diagonal. And 
he will have lost some central control. Of course, my position would not be worse at all, but the game would be about equal if he were to play with d2 to d4. Eventually, his d4 pawn and my c5 pawn will be exchanged. He'll have a rook on d1. It's a pretty equal game. My opponent instead played for detachment. He played knight e4. And now you have the knights. None of the knights are hitting. It, and it's an interesting relationship. You see the knight on d5 and knight on e4 kind of squaring off against one another. My bishop on b7 lined up with actually all three knights, d5, e4, and f3. His plan is eventually to play on the king's side. You see his bishop is on the g7 square. His queen on b1 is on is on that diagonal very effectively. Now b1, h7. Eventually, if it switches to a1, it'll utilize the other long diagonal. So he has some long-distance kingside ideas. His knight on e4 can come to g5. His knight on f3 can come to g5 or e5. And also, he may consider the maneuver later on, knight e4 to g3 to h5. So he has a lot of which can eventually work on my king side. I decided to block some of that off with knight 7 to f6, blocking off the pressure on my g7 pawn and um, challenging his central knight on e4. If he were to now play knight takes f6, then he would have sort of made his last move, knight c3 to e4, ridiculous. And I would have the choice between playing bishop takes f6 or knight takes f6. In this position, I think bishop takes f6 would be best because both of us have very effective bishops on our long diagonal. His bishop on b2 and my bishop on b7 are very good in terms of pressuring the other guy's king side. And so for me to trade off my bishop on f6 with the bishop on b2 would be good. If you take a moment and you look at this position without the knights, just visualize which bishops on the board seem good to you and which bishops don't. I'm sure you have the feeling that the bishops on e2 and e7 are the, are the more passive ones immediately. And the bishops on b7 and b2 are quite good. So by my trading off dark square bishops, it would be a good idea. After I played knight 7 to f6, my opponent came back with knight g3. Now, if you recall the stylistic discussion I gave of my opponent, you kind of feel that his moves are consistent with that. He's not taking control of the center. I have a little more control with, with black of the central squares, but and he's maintaining detachment amongst the pieces. Whenever a conflict comes up between knights, between anything, he simply moves away. He's reorganizing himself slowly along the king's side. Now, once again, most strong chess players in this position would have the central plan playing d2 to d4, probably rook f to d1 first. And that's what I expected, because I expected the best moves, but my opponent held back. First of all, I played h6 here, a move which is difficult to explain, except for the fact that potentially, it's not responding to any immediate threat, but it is responding to potential threats. I'm simply stopping them from having the option of knight g5. I'm also seeing what my opponent is going to do. I want to see what his idea is. And um, it's important to see that in this position, there is no immediate action. And it's very important to know how to deal with a position in which there is not immediate action. Some people may want to impose their will upon the, upon the position. They don't see what to do. They feel like they must do something. But there are two sides to the battle. And if there's in a position like this, black can't do anything immediately, but neither can white. If you try to force something to happen in the position, then by you forcing it, it will be good for the other guy. Sometimes you have to just improve your position and let the game develop naturally. I played h6, a slow, improving move. h7 isn't exposed anymore. Knight g5 is impossible. My opponent played his typical maneuver, queen a1. This move almost seems comical. It's, it's actually quite a good move. It's an interesting move. I mean, I expected it from him. The queen is, um, is effective here. You notice my, my knight on f6 is pinned down to the f6 square. One relationship which should be, which in order to help describe what the queen does on a1, you might immediately think of the bishop on b2, the queen on a1. You'd prefer to have it reversed, the bishop on a1 and the queen on b2 because it would be more powerful. The queen coming to the g7 square is more powerful. That's not really true because the queen would be more exposed on b2. I'd like to just create a situation for you to describe what the nature of doubling and tripling is all about. Because in this situation, you'll notice that the the white queen and bishop are doubled along the a1, h8 diagonal. It's much more common to double rooks and queens than double queens and bishops. So if you look at the position, if you clear off your board now, a lot of the time you'll have rooks and queens on open files. How would you like to organize, usually, two rooks and a queen doubling on a file? Would you like to have your queen in front and two rooks in back? Would you like to have your queen in back, two rooks in front? Or would you like to have your queen between the two rooks. Take a moment to think about that. Of course, there are pluses and minuses to each option. If the queen is in the front, the first entrance will be very deadly, maybe. The queen comes in, it could be very good. 
but the queen will be very exposed. Part of the greatness of having a tripled battery, queen, rook, 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 queen, rook, or rook, rook, queen, is that the first, the first clash of that battering ram is almost to be sacrificed, to be exchanged. A lot of time it'll begin with a rook exchange. So if the queen is in the front, she's too valuable. You don't want to expose her. If the queen is in the back, what will happen is that after the first battery has gone down and an exchange, for instance, the next entrance is not so terribly effective. Your queen is in the back, and in the final roll, your queen is sort of serving as a defender, defending the entering piece. Usually, and this is a rule with many exceptions, of course, the most effective way of tripling is to have the, the relationship of rook, queen, rook. That way, the first entrance is well protected by a follow-up ram of the queen and the rook, and after an exchange, the queen is coming in, defended by a rook, and it can be very powerful. So in learning how to double and triple your pieces, most of all, you're just going to be doubling rooks, for instance, on a file. It's important to understand the relationship between the power pieces that are more powerful, more dangerous, and yet more precious with those that are less so. Give some thought to that discussion of, rook, of rooks and queens. That try to understand and make your own piece with these ideas. If we return to this position in the game after queen a1, if the queen were on b2 and the bishop on a1, it might be interesting and that queen takes g7 would be made, but it wouldn't be so terribly effective. On the other hand, the queen on a1 makes the bishop on b2 very strong and that the knight on f6 can't really move. There's a downside. The queen on a1 is now only serving as a bishop. All it can ever do for the time being is defend the bishop on b2 and help to emphasize white's control of that diagonal. So there is an upside and a downside to this configuration. After queen a1, I made a move which I don't think was very accurate. I played a7 to a6. My thought process with this move was that, first of all, I can't do anything immediately. I'm just improving my position. And I still thought that my opponent's best plan, I, st I do believe my opponent's best plan, was to play d2 to d4 and exchange, take a little more control of the center, exchange these pawns. And I felt that after d4, eventually what would happen is that I would play c takes d4 or he would take on c5, and a knight, white knight would come to d4. Later on, I wanted to have a piece on c7, and I felt he would play knight b5. So by playing a6, I was simply gaining a little bit of control of the b5 square for the future in which I play rook c7, for instance, or maybe queen c7. And also, at some point, I can continue on the queen side with moves like b6 to b5. In retrospect, I think this, move, this, this decision was a little bit silly because by playing a6, my, my pawn is exposed to his bishop on e2. So if he doesn't decide to play d4, later on I'm going to have to worry about defending it. Plus, if a white knight comes to c4, my b6 pawn is now undefended. So by playing a6, I gained a little bit of control of the b5 square, but I weakened two pawns, which now I'm going to have to keep an eye on. I think more accurate would have been rook c7, beginning my, my own plan of development, which you'll see, which actually parallels my opponents. I want to play rook c7, put my queen to a8, because at this point, that's pretty much the best I can ask for for my queen. The reason I want to play queen a8 is because... First of all, his queen is out of the line of fire. And what's going to happen sooner or later is the D and C files will open up. And if those trades are made, where what is the ideal square for the black queen? Do you see a good place for it to be? There's nowhere on the king side. There's no way to get to the queen side. I want to have doubled rooks on the C file. If my queen is in the D file, then if he has a rook on D1, it'll be exposed. So the A8 square is quite handy. This is also part of my opponent's logic, of course. With the queen being on A1, it does something and is out of the way. I think it would have been a little better for me to play rook c7. After a6, he played knight e5. So now we see the continuation of my opponent's stylistic play. Instead of playing the logical central move d4, he's deciding upon a different plan. He wants to begin with a detached flank attack of knight e5 followed by f4 and f5. A very, in fact, a very effective plan. My opponent's move knight e5 is very effective. By playing a6, what I've done is while I've taken control of the b5 square, I've given control of the b6 square. So what he's done by playing knight e5 is he's given up any potential of playing knight d4 to b5. I have that, that square now. And he's begun the maneuver knight e5 to c4. A perfect response. And now my opponent has a very strong idea. He wants to begin a flank attack with f4 and f5. This would open up the f file where his rook is very well placed. It would threaten to mess up my pawn structure with the trade on e6, fe6, fe6. Notice that if that trade were to take place, you would have very good control of the g6 square. If I were to handle the pawn on f5 differently, and the trade were to take place 
on f5 instead of e6, then his knight would come to f5. And we already have a feeling, a bad feeling, about black's position. g7 is being tickled. e7 is under attack. His knights are good. f file open. a1, h8 diagonal looking hairy. Things don't feel so good. So by playing knight e5, he, he begins the maneuver knight e5 to c4 and the threat of f2 to f4 to f5. Now's a good time for me to have a think about how to deal with my opponent's plan. What would you do? What space has he left behind? This is an atypical position because white would usually have played d2 to d4. By playing knight e5, his plan of f4 makes the plan of d4 impossible. His pawns on f4, e3, and d4 would not work because the e3 pawn would be too weak. So we can see that by playing knight e5, if he does soon play f4 like it's looking like he will, d4 will no longer be good. So we can consider the pawn on d2 to be sort of a fixed weakness because d4 is inconsistent with his plan. Often in stopping our opponent's plans, we can hone in on one of their weaknesses and make them defend it. I play the move knight b4. Now the ideas of this move are in some ways simple and in some ways more complex. For one thing, I'm simply stopping his next move of f4 because the d2 pawn is hanging. If he were to play f4, I would play queen takes d2. And now my queen can't really be chased because I could play queen takes e3 next. I'll have won a pawn. He's in big trouble. So first of all, by playing knight b4, I've simply stopped his immediate idea of f4 because of the d2 pawn. Now, he has a number of different ways of defending that pawn. For one thing, he can play d4, but we've already seen that's inconsistent with his plan. Not very good. He can defend it with a rook. If he plays rook c to d1 then for one thing, it's kind of a strange move because he's developed his rook to c1, then he's just left the c file for the d file. The rook is completely passive there. My rook will have control of the c file later on if anything opens up. Also, I have the tactical resource of knight c2, which at some moment might be useful. Rook c to d1 has a suspicious feeling about it. The other option, which is what he played, is rook f to d1. This move has a downside as well. When he plays his plan of f2 to f4, his rook will no longer be on the f file. So by playing knight b4, what I did is I forced him to deal with a weakness in his position, the d2 pawn, and to sort of lessen the poison in his plan, f4, f5. So notice, I'm not stopping his ideas, but just making them a little less effective. It's also important to understand that my opponent has the ability to kick out my knight from b4. It's not like it's an anchored square. But if he were to play a3 and kick out my knight, how should I handle it? Think about the space left behind. With a3, he's exposed a weakness. I would play the maneuver knight c6. If he trades on c6 now, he's lost a very good central piece. And if not, my next move will be knight a5, and his b3 pawn is suddenly very exposed. I can attack it more later with queen d5. If he defends, for instance, with queen a2, a move like bishop d5 or queen d5 would pressure b3 more. So my knight on b4 can be kicked out, but at some expense to my opponent. So here he defended d2 with rook f to d1. Now that I've reduced some of the effectiveness of his plan of f4, f5, I continued with my development, rook c7. This is a very important thing to understand. In many of my other annotated games, I've discussed the theme of prophylaxis, stopping your opponent's ideas. Now this is one way of handling the reality of the fact that your opponent does have ideas in chess. They want to accomplish certain things, and you want to stop them. So the basis of prophylaxis is stopping your opponent's idea. But there's another way of handling it. The other way is to make your opponent's ideas less useful, to let them accomplish what they, what they want to accomplish, but simply take what they've left behind. And so if you look very simply at the pawns on f2 and e3 in chess, if white wants to play f4, one thing to do is to play a move like g5, stopping f4. Another thing to do would be to prepare, after he plays f4, to occupy the e4 square take advantage of what he's just weakened. So there are, there are different ways to use the consciousness of your opponent's plan. He played f4. Once again, I felt like his best plan would be to play, now that it, especially now that his rooks are on d1 and c1, to play d4. But of course we know that my opponent doesn't want to do that because it stylistically doesn't work out so well for him. And that's also part of why I played rook c7. If d4, I now have the option of shuttling my queen out of the way, queen a8 hitting his g2 pawn and preparing rook f to c8, doubling on the c file. It's also important to notice that if you look at the four rooks after, for instance, queen a8, bishop to f1, defending g2, rook f c8, the four rooks are placed in a very different way. I have doubled rooks on the c file, while he has one rook on the c file, one rook on the d file. It's sort of a strange 
balancing effect here because if the, both files were to open, he would have the D file, yes, but if we exchange, he will have to draw a rook off the D file. So it's hard to say which, which rooks are more effective, but while different, they have a, a similar power. After my opponent played rook f to d1, I thought that uh, the most logical plan for him would be to play d4. Rook c7 was a good response to that. So I had a good plan against it. He played f4. This is a very instructive moment in the game. Take a moment. Put the game on pause. Think about how you would handle this position. So we see that his plan is to play f4 to f5. Let's think about the different ways to respond to a plan in general. The first way is to stop it, which is in fact what I did. Another way is to allow one's opponent to execute their plan and to step in behind what they've just left. A third way, which I've just recently discovered in my analysis, is to accelerate the fulfillment of your opponent's plan so as to throw off their timing. Now what I'm about to describe is something which I've just recently come across in my study of chess and something which I think is of incredible power in chess and in competition. If someone has an attack in chess or in war or in any form of battle, there's a timing to that attack. What's very important is the speed to the attack and also the slow, the patience to the attack. My opponent's plan is to play f5. First of all, I played the move queen c8, a very simple move, a good move, stopping the move f5 because now I have better control of the f5 square. Now I'm going to show you another option. I could have played the move queen a8. Now my opponent's plan is to play f5. If I take on f5 to take back with his knight, then his knight is very strong on f5. It pressures g7. It pressures e7. It doesn't necessarily have a next move immediately. Maybe he'll bring his rook on d1 back to f1, start to think about different attacking ideas. Maybe his knight on e5 can move to c4. Maybe his bishop on e2 can move to c4, pressure f7. In this position with his knights on f5 and e5, his bishop on b2, queen on a1, he has a lot of potential attacking ideas. So that is his plan. I'm going to show you a variation which I found in my study of this game. If I play queen a8 here, attacking his g2 pawn, he would respond probably with a move like bishop f1, say. Now, the g2 pawn is defended. Once again, my opponent has a plan. He wants to play f5. Moves like g6 may come into thought. Moves like queen c8 may come into consideration. If I play g6, notice it's a big weakening move. My f6 knight is now undefended because... He's lined up on it. I don't want to make a move like that. Remember how I described his plan of f5, trading on, f, on f5, knight coming to f5, that he didn't have any immediate threat, but that his pieces were very good? What would happen if I simply played the move rook d8? A simple improving move. Doing nothing, but improving. My opponent's idea is f5. Okay, let him do it. Now remember we said that at one point he'd probably want to trade off those pawns and either utilize my weak square on g6 or maybe he'd at one point have time to bring his knight into f5. Okay, you know what? Fine. He takes f5. This seems like a strange kind of suicidal chess. First he had an idea. I allowed him to do the idea. Now I'm encouraging his knight to f5. Look at that, knight f5. Now we recall that in my discussion of this position I said that the pieces were very active. They had some potential ideas. His knight really, really didn't know what to do. Okay. Let's let him accelerate his process. I'll play bishop to e4, attacking his knight on f5. Suddenly this piece, which, is, which has great potential, which is all over the place, is attacked directly. It has to move. There are no good sacrifices. If it moves back, it's ridiculous. Plus my bishop on e4 gives me very good control of the light squares. He has to tra trade knight for bishop. Knight takes e7. I would respond rook takes e7. Look at what's happened. My opponent has executed his entire plan. In fact, what I've done is I have accelerated his process of executing his plan. What I've done is I have made him go too fast for himself. In this position, I have all active pieces. My rook on e7, my rook on d8, both on great open files. My knight on b4 is entering the d3 and c2 squares. My bishop on e4 lashes out to g2, to d3 and to c2. 
His knight on e5 is exposed. Notice if he uses the, the idea knight c4, trying to attack my b6 pawn, and bishop takes f6, undermining my king side, I have the move rook e6, defending both threats. Black's position is perfectly fine. My opponent's d2 pawn is weak, and if he plays d2 to d4, he both blocks in his queen on a1, bishop on b2, and weakens his e3 pawn. Black's game is great. I'd like you to take a moment now and look over this line a few more times. Not just once, a few more times. I have learned a tremendous amount from studying this game, and, and I actually spent about three or four hours one day, and then another two hours the next day just dwelling on this position, trying to understand the nature of what I've just described to you. And the, the, the variation which I showed you is very simple, a few moves, but it was the product of a lot of very hard work. Because after queen a8, for instance, my opponent has many different options. He has the move a3, attacking my knight, driving my knight back to c6 or d5, which blocks the diagonal. Then he can try to continue with moves like f5. He has many different ideas, and there are a lot of tactics in the position. What I've shown you is, is after all the tactics don't work, after all the analysis I've done, this is the result, and these are the, the very simple, fine moves. But just if you take a moment and you look at the position now, white has an idea to play f5. My process was very simple. I stopped the idea. I played queen c8, which is a good move. My opponent then played queen b1, trying to play f5, and I played queen a8 then. What I tried to do is I tried to drive his queen off the a1, h8 diagonal because I didn't want my g7 pawn to be pressured. So I used this idea, but I really was trying to adjust his queen. In fact, I should have left his queen on a1, where it's a slightly more aggressive attacking piece, but a little more out of place. Once more, I wanted him to play f5, his idea, then I would help his knight to where it wanted to go. Then I would attack its knight, making it go further into where it wants to go. And suddenly we've seen that white has been forced to go faster than he wanted to go. So we see the queen a8 would have been a fascinating way of dealing with my opponent's idea. I played queen c8, stopping f5. Now he played a very simple move, queen b1, which moves off the a1, h8 diagonal and prepares to play f4, f5. He's simply gaining more control of the f5 square. Now that his queen was off the diagonal, I wanted to move my knight on f6 at one point. I played queen a8. Now I'm attacking g2. I think it would have been better for me not to coax his queen off the a1 square because it would have been a little more caged in there. After queen a8, he attacked my knight, a3. So notice his g2 pawn is under attack. He could have played a move like bishop f1, but my position would have been very good then. My real point here, what, the reason I put his queen to be the b1 square, is because now I wanted to play knight e4, so that he doesn't, he doesn't have any more control over the f5 square, because if f5 I play knight takes g3, h takes g3, and then a move like bishop e4, followed by taking on f5, and I win a pawn. And if he trades on e4, knight takes e4, bishop takes e4, I control the f5 square. So, so by playing queen c8, I forced his queen to b1. You notice if his queen were on a1, in this position I couldn't really play knight e4. Because after he would play a move like knight c4, my b6 pawn is under attack and my g7 pawn is under attack. A bad situation. So after queen a8, he played a3, attacking my knight. I came back, knight c6. And here he continued with his plan f5. You should notice that if I had played the slightly different move order, if his queen had been on a1 instead of b1, the only difference would have been if I had played queen a8 immediately. In this position, I would have had to move knight c6 to a5, attacking the b3 pawn. If the pawn moves to b4, the main difference would be that now I would have to move knight b3, attacking queen and rook a big fork. And if he plays a move like queen a2, his queen is ridiculously passive. My position is very good. Knight a5, he could defend in a number of different ways. He could move his bishop to c3, for instance, exposing the queen's defense and attacking my knight on a5 to mess up my structure. So... In this regard, it would have been more accurate also for me to have my queen on a8 immediately with his queen still on a1. The b3 pawn would have been more of a weakness with my knight sitting on b4 if he were to kick it out. And now after f5, we can fall back into the understanding of who my opponent is, the nature of his style, and how to deal with it. What would you do now? First of all, what is my opponent's threat, if it's his move, is to play f takes e6. When I take back, he'll play knight g6 and I've given him too many weaknesses to play with, and my position is quite bad. His knight on g6 is very powerful. That's his idea, and that idea has to be responded to. If I play knight takes e5, then he would play bishop takes e5, with tempo on my rook on c7, 
After the rook moves, he'll trade on e6. My position will be weakened. If my rook comes to c6, I should note, he'll play bishop f3, kicking the rook off again. If my rook moves back after trades, things won't be so good. If I were to respond to his threat, f takes e6 by playing e takes f5. After knight takes f5, the e7 bishop is hanging. It's difficult to see a good plan. So here there are two realistic ways of treating the position. One is to play bishop d6, which is a very tactical move. I'm challenging his knight on e5, and if his knight moves, I'm challenging his knight on g3. The downside to this move is that it's very suspicious, because if when his knight on e5 moves, I'm exposed to a trade on f6. Bishop takes f6, weakening my pawn structure off to play g takes f6. So bishop d6 is a move which we should be very suspicious about intuitively. In fact, I felt bishop d6 was bad, and so I didn't go into deep analysis. I maintained the detachment. I played knight d8. What is my point? For one thing, my bishop now is threatening g2 again, and the idea is simple. I want to play after, if he plays f takes e6, I'll play knight takes e6, strengthening my game. If he were to play knight f5 now, attacking my bishop on e7, for one thing here, I could play bishop takes g2, but if that weren't, weren't a threat, I would have the option of bishop back to d8, keeping control of the f6 square. And his knights on f5 and e5 are, are there, yes, but I'll push them back soon enough. You should notice that after bishop d8, I have the threat of bishop e4, for instance. Knight d8 is a nice move. My opponent's taken some space, but he can't go much further. Here he challenged the diagonal with bishop f3. I want you to notice once again the two different principles operating here. In that one variation, the most instructive of the game, I had the possibility of taking on f5, coaxing him forward, coaxing him further forward, and taking advantage of the fact that he had to run forward. I couldn't do that here because I cannot coax him forward fast enough. After e f5, knight f5, his knight has the ability to maintain its potential. It can stay on f5, and it's very strong. It's a beautiful idea that a piece can, be, can have power on a square, not because of its true force in that square, because of, but because of its potential force. And so almost the best way of taking advantage of a piece that needs to go somewhere is to push it there immediately. This is, op uh, this is often a situation, actually, in chess, where if there's a weak, weak square in the game, the whole battle can be around that weak square, and players can often get very bogged down in the idea of stopping, one, stopping a piece from coming to a square. Instead of, so in the Sicilian, often, if black has a structure of a pawn on e5 and on d6, and white of a pawn on e4 and an open d-file, the whole game will often be about white, white knights on c3, bishop on c4, other knight on e3, everything piling up on the d5 square. So one way of dealing with this with this battle, you simply keep on piling up pieces, put a knight on e7, a bishop on e6, everything to control d5. But another way is for black to let all three white pieces simply have the d5 square and go about the game somewhere else, letting them all sort of duplicate one another. After knight d8, he played bishop f3. I traded, bishop takes f3, g takes f3. And here I made a move which maintained the detachment in the position and played into what I see as my opponent's weakness, but might not have been the most objectively correct decision. I played the move knight h7, which is very strange. Remember when I, when I was introducing this game, I talked about how I shouldn't so much rush to create tactical, concrete decisions, but let my opponent have a position in which he must go forward. Well, in this position, my opponent's the, the correct flow for my opponent is to put his pieces very aggressively in a sort of precarious position. That's something he has difficulty doing stylistically. The other option I could have played was to move bishop d6, which challenges his position and creates some crazy variations because all, almost all of my pieces are hanging here, but for some reason, tactically, he can't really take advantage of it. You should notice that if a lot of trades were to take place and somehow his bishop and my knight on f6 were to trade, my king side is very weak, but after he plays f takes e6, f takes e6, it's important to understand that when his queen comes into g6, my rook on c c7 is shuttling over to g7. So by definition, the only way for him to actually come to my king's side is to allow me to have a very powerful defense and to open up a counterplay on the king's side. So while this position, while the option of bishop takes f6 with his pawn on f5, the option of bishop takes f6 may seem brutal in some positions. that can be very brutal. In this position, for him to take advantage of it allows me a very strong form of counterplay. So after, after bishop f3, g f3, I had the option of bishop d6. This might be an interesting position for you to study a little bit on your own if you'd like to pause the lesson here and look at it, because I'm really challenging White's right to live, sort of. He has all of these things out up in the air, 
and yet it's very difficult for him to execute. For instance, if his knight moves off the e5 square, his pawn in f3 hangs. If he trades on e6, his potential of trading the e6 on e6 is no more, and after knight takes e6, my knight has become aggressive instead of passive. I can always have the option of trading on e5 if I want it, and then taking on f3. The game would be very complicated. One sample variation after bishop d6 would be f takes e6, knight takes e6, immediate occupation then with knight f5. My best move here would be the calm, rook d8, simply defending on d6. At first, when studying this position, I thought that white should simply have an overwhelming game here. And playing in a, ch in a tournament game, I would probably now have the same intuitive feeling. I think that somehow white should have a very good way of taking advantage of it, but it's very hard to find. For instance, if he plays a move like knight c4, attacking my bishop and my pawn on b6, I simply move back my bishop, bishop e7. Now, if he were to take on b6, then I would play queen takes f3. So, it's strange. I have weaknesses all over the board, but so does he. Notice that my king now is a little bit safer than his. His king does have more air in front of him. I have moves like knight g5, which begin a big counterattack. Suddenly, f3 is falling apart. This is after defensive moves. If he were to play a move rook d1 off of that file to the f1, then his d2 pawn will be hanging on his knight on c4 moves, and I can always kick it out with b5. So, some very hairy things are going on here. So this is a position in which it looks really, really dangerous, but white has no real way of taking advantage of it. It's important to see that in playing this game, I was playing with a sense for who my opponent is, but I was also trying to make the best moves. In this exact position, it's my nature to play moves like this, to calculate everything if I sense that it's necessary to have faith in myself, to do the calculation, and go in for it. But here I was running a little short of time. My sense of danger told me bishop d6 was an unnecessary investment of time. I didn't really have enough time on my clock to, to check it out all fully. And maintaining detachment can work very well against Bezeld because it means that he'll have to make the concrete decisions, and he much prefers to pick up the pieces that you leave behind. After knight h7, he played queen e4, a very strong move. He centralizes his queen and offers a queen trade. Now, this is a very effective plan. In fact, it's just a wonderful move because his king is surprisingly weak in this game, as you'll see later on, and it can be exposed to a pretty violent sudden attack. If I were to trade off queens, for instance, queen takes e4, f takes e4, my position would be slightly worse because my queen side is a little loose, my b6 pawn is hanging, my a6 pawn could come under attack later. He can play moves like b4 because of my rook on c7 being hanging because of the, the pin, or d4, and he has a very strong center. I don't like my position here. The other way for me to trade queens would be to play, instead of queen takes e4, queen to d5, kind of line up, bring my queen one step closer, attacking the b3 pawn. And um, But here again, I think after queen takes d5, e takes d5, d4, my position is slightly, slightly worse because my d5 pawn is a little bit weak after the d and c pawns come off the board. So here I said no problem, I played queen c8. When you see the end of this game, if you then go back and you look at the moves up to that, you may be a little surprised in how my sudden attack comes about. I'm not rushing forward. My moves like knight c6, knight d8, knight h7, I'm giving my opponent space. But slowly, I'm circling around him. After queen c8, he played f4. A good move. His idea is he's strengthening the e5 square, yes, but what he's really doing is he's stopping my threat. I wanted to play the move knight g5, attacking the white queen, and it would be very difficult for him to defend everything because he has to defend the f3 squares and the h3 squares and the f5 squares. His queen would be dislodged. My knight coming to g5 would be very bad for him. So f4 is a good move, strengthening his center and stopping my threat. And here, I used the device which I discussed earlier, that of speeding my opponent's process to confuse himself, sort of. He wants to eventually play f takes e6, yeah. If I play e takes f5 now, it's not so good because after knight takes f5, his knights and queen and bishop and everything are very terrifying. But here I made him make a decision. I play the move bishop to h4. This is a move which is psychologically difficult to respond to because while my opponent has been slowly building his position, and in this position his, his game is actually quite good, he now has to deal with what he has immediately. In other words, he has got to, 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 make, to make a decision about how to treat his center. His pawn on f5 is beautiful. My knight on d8 is passive. My queen on c8 looks passive. His knight on g3 is defending his pawn. His queen is well centralized. But by playing bishop h4, what I've done is I've said, okay, 
Either you fire the gun now, or I take you apart. The point being that his knight on g3 is attacked. I want to play simply bishop takes g3, h takes g3, e takes f5. And I've won a pawn, and he has nothing to show for it. So what I'm doing by playing bishop h4 is forcing him to relieve the central tension, f takes e6. So notice that there are two different ways of treating an uncomfortable tension. The most natural would be for me to play e takes f5 myself, but that would give him too much time. Instead, I force him to resolve the tension. After bishop h4, my, my threat to win a pawn forces f takes e6, and I played queen takes e6. So I was able to bring a piece into the game. And here my opponent played a big mistake. I believe his best move was knight f5. That's what I was looking at in the game. And my feeling is that white's position is slightly better, although it's very complicated. His knights on e5 and f5 are aggressively placed, but they're also a little bit loose. Notice the knight on f5 is defended by his queen on e4, which can always be attacked by moves like knight f6. His knight on e5 is pinned, because if it moves, I'll play queen takes e4. My, my bishop on h4 is attacked, so I would probably come back by bishop f6. So you notice that his knights are good, they're active, but they don't really do anything, and actually the knight on e5 isn't allowed to move at all now because of two pins to his bishop on b2, queen on e4. But my feeling is that in this position, white has a small advantage. He should play a move like b4, try to undermine my queen side. The position is very complicated. His king is a little bit looser than mine. He has good central control, but central weakness as well. It would be a very interesting position to play. But this kind of position would be very difficult for him to play because he would have had to make a very concrete assessment of hanging pieces. Notice by playing knight f5, bishop f6, and leaving his three central pieces where they are, they're all very precarious. Instead, he played the move queen c4, trying to force the trade into an endgame. And here I began my attack. I played the move bishop takes g3. Now, from the moves that I've played so far, you probably don't have a sense that I've played a terribly aggressive game. I've played what the position brought to me. I made a couple moves which I don't like so much. I didn't like my decision to play a6 because I weakened my b6 and a6 squares. Actually, these are weaknesses which you can feel now. Like a6 is hanging. I've weakened my queen side a little bit. I would have preferred to have played queen d8 to a8 immediately. But now, by playing these detached moves, by letting my opponent try to force the issue, he was a little uncertain about the tensions and played queen c4. I kind of played the snow with tires routine here, which a wonderful man who plays this tournament in Bermuda every year named Paul Santamond. He's kind of like the real-life incarnation of Kramer, the Seinfeld character. He's just an absolutely brilliant man who's a very good friend of mine. He talks about being like snow with tires. Just don't give anything to hold on to. And he's playing queen c4. <laughs> My opponent needed something to hold on to. He needed to trade off the queens. After I played bishop takes g3, he has a big problem. Notice the feeling of this game. The whole way... He was slowly going forward, maintaining detachment, difficult building, fascinating positional struggle with knights over maneuvering everywhere, potential central breaks, but not quite. Slowly, me taking the space he left behind. Maybe I could have enticed him forward a little faster, but I have been enticing him forward. I've been forcing him to do what he needs to do. He's been building. It's been a very beautiful build. It's like this slow, wonderful symphony of a chess game. And now suddenly something's happened. If you were to play queen takes e6, after bishop takes h2 check, the in-between move, king takes h2, knight takes e6, I've won a pawn. My endgame is much better. His only other option is to take back the bishop. But this is when his sense of danger should have kicked in. He had to go into the worst endgame. But remember how I said that sometimes my opponent doesn't quite have a keen sense of danger when the bullets start to fly? They're flying now. h takes g3, I played the move queen h3 which he, of course, saw, de attacking the g3 pawn. The only way to defend it is with king f2. Now, my opponent thought that this would be okay, because his king is a little loose now. Yeah, I have, I have a check, but his, he's coming in. His next move will be rook d1 to h1, chasing my queen back, and he's going to use the dh file himself. That's what he thinks. I played the move queen h2 check. He played king f3. My opponent still thought his position was very good, but I had other ideas. In fact, when I played bishop takes g3, I saw the continuation that I played now. Take a moment. What would you do? The rest of this game is of a very different nature than all the preceding moves. Now I go after him. His next move may be queen e2, attacking my queen. If, he, if the d-pawn can be defended, he might want to play rook h1, pushing the queen back. But notice now his king is on f3. I'm sort of coaxing it forward like a lobster out of the... Under, from underneath the rock. 
Continue the attack. I put 96. You feel what my idea is? I'm going to sacrifice a piece. My next move is going to be knight g5 check. After fg5, knight g5, his king has to come up further. King f4, or g4. I'll be down a piece, but his king will be sitting out there. Now he can't force his king back. If he were to play rook h1, first of all, I would have the option of queen takes d2. But at any moment, I can play knight g5 and force his king to come forward. After knight e6, he's in huge trouble. I have a burning attack. When I played the move bishop takes g3, my opponent should have had a very keen sense of danger and gone into a worse end game and tried to defend. But he didn't sense it fast enough. And what's interesting is that the first game I beat him in 97, in the same tournament in Bermuda, a very similar thing happened. It was a slow developing game. Suddenly I sacrificed a rook and mated him. After knight e6, he realized he was in trouble. He played queen f1. Now I want you to think about each move for black. See how you develop the attack. What would you do? Don't expect when you attack in chess for there to be a clear path to mate. We have to take it one step at a time. First of all, I sacrificed a piece. Knight hg5 check. He took fg5, knight g5. King f4. His king could have also come to g4, but then I would have had the additional uh, option of f5 check, which would have been very unpleasant for him to deal with. After king f4, what would you do? This was a critical move in the attack. This is a moment in chess when a lot of players have become impassioned. You're attacking the guy, you've sacrificed a piece, his king is locked into the center. You should notice that my knight on g5 is an incredibly powerful piece. His king can't come back to the f3 square, can't run to e4, can't go anywhere because my knight holds him back. My queen on h2 is sitting there poised for action, but those are the only two attacking pieces. Does my opponent have a good, improving move? Not really. He's hanging by thread. I brought another piece into the game. Rook e8. A slow move down a piece. For one thing, I'm on the e5 square. It's a prophylactic move as well. He might have wanted to play knight g4, but now knight g4 would lose to rook e4 check. By playing rook e8, I'm beginning the maneuver rook e8 to e6 to f6 check, which will be devastating, and I'm stopping his knight on e5 from moving. He played queen h1. What now? Of course, I don't want to trade queens. I played queen f2 check. He played king g4. At this point in the game, we were both running short of time. And I played a very I played a good move, a, a building move, one that maintains my advantage and is in fact winning. I played the move rook c to e7. Maintaining the theme of just building slowly. His e f uh, my next move would be rook takes e5, just giving up a rook for Two pieces, rook e5, bishop e5, rook takes e5, with now my rook, queen, and knight will all be crashing in his king, and it'll be mate very soon. The point is that if he defends with a move like d4, his e3 pawn will hang. If he moves his rook off d1, rook f1, which is what he played, his d2 pawn will hang. But I had a more accurate move. Try to find it. The best way to play is kind of strange, and it's very interesting why I didn't see it. I could have played queen e2 check, king h4. Do you see the move now? It's strange the way sometimes we may want to go to a square, but to secure a square in a certain way is often difficult for us to see, almost an optical illusion. I didn't see the move g6. Here my threat is very simple, queen h5 mate. If he stops by playing g4, queen f2 will be mate. Notice how my knight and queen work together. A very simple move, g6. His king is locked into where it is, where it is now. Queen h5 is coming. If he blocks, is the only other move with knight g4. After my move, rook e4, he's devastated. My position is winning. So queen e2 check would have been a very powerful way to continue. But I instead I played rook c7, a slow build. He played rook f1, trying to drive my queen off. No problem, I slid over, queen takes d2. Notice that if you put yourself in white shoes for a moment, part of the mentality behind rook c7 is that I saw white had absolutely no way to stop my attack or even slow it down, and I could slowly build. If I had any sense of urgency and if I'd seen that White had any way of coming at it, I would have looked harder and I would have certainly seen Queen E2 check, but there was no reason for it. And a lot of chess has to do with making a practical decision. I saw my position was huge, and I didn't want to use too much time to run too short of time, because if you're in big time pressure, you can make a, a large mistake, and there was no reason for that. He has no way to improve. If you try to find White's moves, you'll see that any piece you move has a downside. 
So after rook f1, queen takes d2. Now everything has remained the same. His king is still trapped on g4, but I'm attacking his bishop on b2. He had to deal with that. He played bishop c3. No problem. Queen takes e3. I'll pick up pawns while he chases me around. Now I have three pawns for the piece. His king is still sitting on g4, and I still have the same old threat of rook takes e5. My opponent attacked my queen again. Rook f1. I played queen f2. We see that I picked up two pawns. He's moved me around a little bit. I have the same ideas. A move like f5 check is coming. He's falling apart. He played queen g1. He has to keep on attacking my queen, because if he gives me a moment, I'll just mate him. What would you do here? I came back. Queen f6. Reorganizing my attack. My threat now is queen e6 check, king h4, queen h3 mate. Notice if he were to have gone to f4, knight h3 check would win his queen. My queen wasn't needed to hold this king back because my knight is doing that trick. Queen f6 reorganizes. If I had immediately used the idea of playing f5 check after my opponent had played king h4, it would be hard for me to develop my attack, and now my queen has a problem. I have to figure out how to get my queen out of the attack. There's no reason to check him immediately. I can do that whenever I want. Queen f6 has a powerful threat. He played the move queen f1, so he stopped my idea. Queen e6 check now would be met by queen f5. Notice that the idea of removing the defender wouldn't work, because after h5 check, he could play king takes g5. His king is just happily stomping up the board. After queen f1, the position is very critical. At this point, it's completely winning. Take a few minutes. Find my attacking idea. I played h5, throwing his position into turmoil. He has two options. If he, play, he can play king h4 or king takes h5. If he were to play king h4, I have a number of options. But the simplest one is knight f3 check, king h3. If king takes h5, of course, queen g5 would be mate. After king h3, I can do a lot of different things. But the, but the easiest, knight takes e1. And if he would play rook takes e1, the easiest way would be for me to just trade queens. Queen takes f1, rook takes f1, and after rook takes e5, bishop takes e5, rook takes e5, I'm up three pawns in a rook, on a, in a rook and pawn end game. My opponent can resign here. There are many other ways to win, but this is a very clear-cut and forced path to victory. After h5 check, he played king takes h5. This is the climactic position. How did I win? Pause the game now. Think. Don't start it again until you think you see the win. Look at all the variations. I played the knight sacrifice, knight f3. Do you understand why I did it? First of all, he has two different ways to capture the knight. If he had played queen takes f3, what did I have in mind? Rook takes e5, removing the defender. If he takes back, queen takes f3 check will be devastating. And after king g4, I play rook g5 check, drawing the king away from the queen. King h3 is his best move. If king h4, I would play queen h6 check and mate next. After king h3, queen takes f3. His last gasp is rook takes e8, king h7, and he's finished. I'm up material, and I'll mate him pretty quickly. Rook h5 mate is threatened, and queen takes g3 mate is threatened. Too much to deal with. If he had played knight takes f3, you see the variation I had calculated? Queen h6 check. King g4, only move. Rook e4 check. Rook takes e4. Rook takes e4. King f5. Mate in 1. Queen g6. Finishes it off. So the move knight f3 is a brutal one. First of all, I have a simple threat. Queen g5 mate. We see that he can't capture the knight with knight takes f3 or queen takes f3. His only other option was to try to run away. He played the move king g4. And after the simple knight h2 check, he loses his queen and he resigned. So the, my final move of the game, knight f3, was very powerful because his position was sort of hanging on the brink. He was just about to fall off a cliff and I kind of threw a wrench into the whole system right before it went over. So if you think back to how I introduced this game, you see that I had a very keen sense for my opponent's style of play. He likes very unorthodox positional maneuvering. He likes detachment. He doesn't like to make decisions. He doesn't like to take control of the center right away. Sometimes when the position starts to explode, he's not quite ready for it yet because he has some kind of 
fascination with an attraction to what comes before the explosion. And so he almost doesn't want the explosion to actually happen. And so we notice that in that critical moment, when I played Bishop Takes G3, he wasn't his sense of danger didn't quite kick in because he didn't want it to. And I got an immediate violent attack. You should also take very keen notice of how I won this game with a huge mating attack. My moves before the attack, preceding the attack, seemed to all move backwards. I didn't use much of my energy at all. I used my opponent's energy. And in some points of this game, I didn't use my opponent's energy enough. My two real inaccuracies of this game, the first one was a6, which was a little bit weakening, and the second was queen c8. And that whole discussion of how queen a8 was a better move, the idea of queen a8 was to let my opponent fulfill his main idea, but to fulfill it too quickly. And so this brings up a whole new understanding of what it means to have a plan, because there's a timing to the, to the plan. It's not so much that the, that the plan wants to be executed, but the plan's power can be found in the process of execution. And so we can throw off the timing either by slowing it down or sometimes by, by speeding it up, which seems very strange. And also, I want you to think back on how I dealt with playing an opponent with a style. I did not force the issue. I didn't try to make the game violent and crazy because he wouldn't be good in concrete positions. Because he's a good player, he'll be good in all positions. I let the position come naturally. I made the decision as best I could. And I let him try to find the best moves in difficult chess positions. And at one point, his own style came into conflict with what the position demanded.